Hello and welcome to Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Abdi. As India celebrates 75 years of independence, CNBC TV18 has pledged to conduct a month-long awareness program on importance of long-term financial planning and wealth creation. Today, we focus on those who are just getting started in their careers. Savvy young Indians in their 20s and 30s have been flocking to the stock market in droves over the last two years. But as exciting as the stock market may sound, it is equally, if not more important, for these millennials to have a holistic financial plan which is linked to their goals so that any downturn does not upset the apple cart. Joining in in this endeavor is Vishal Dhawan of Plan Ahead Wealth Advisors, who will talk about getting started, especially for those in their late 20s and early 30s. Vishal, thanks very much for joining in. You know, often the biggest hurdle uh, for financial planning, I don't mean just, you know, investing randomly, is getting started, right? So let's start with somebody who's got their first salary. Should investing discipline start here? I mean, the first paycheck itself, or is it more like, let me enjoy my first few salaries? You know, I can do it from the sixth month the second year onwards, or should it be the very first paycheck? Thanks, Omera, for having me over. So I clearly believe that, um, you know, saving and investing is a lot like starting a diet plan. I think you always want to postpone it to a later point. And very often when you're starting your career, this tends to be driven by two or three different things. One is you just don't have you haven't had the freedom so far to be able to spend in the way that you wanted to. You had controls put by parents, maybe by siblings, uh, and you just want to go out and you know spend on things that you wanted to spend on. Maybe an electronic gadget, maybe a, a you know maybe entertainment. So there's lots of sort of unfulfilled desires that you want to uh, take care of. The second is just the plethora of options. There are so many things that you can buy into when you want to start investing that sometimes it just creates uh, confusion because you have too many choices. Should you buy a mutual fund? Should you do in the stock market? Everyone around you is giving you some advice. Uh, there's a friendly insurance agent telling you what to do. Uh, so it's it's really you know complex. And very clearly, we don't have a lot of financial literacy as a part of our college programs, school programs, et cetera. So very clearly, when you come in there, you get confused and therefore you tend to uh, defer these decisions. The third thing very clearly that we find is that it's very difficult for a lot of people to sit down when they're young and define financial goals. Um, and we think this is actually the best starting point because what you want to do is figure out what you want to use your money for. Is it going to be to upgrade your uh, education because you need a master's to go forward in your career? Is it going to be that you need to help your parents pay down a loan because your parents are reaching their retirement phase? Is it that you want to save towards your own mm. uh, objectives of maybe becoming an entrepreneur in a few years? So I think the moment you start to define goals, I think it becomes much easier to build your investment strategy as a result of that. Okay. Last but not the least, uh, don't forget about the fact that investing is different from savings. I think a lot of times these two things get uh, confused and you end up saying that, you know, I have the money lying in my bank account and therefore I've done a great job. I think you need to move from saving to investments uh, because if you start that early, then it's a really, really good habit. And I think anything which gets uh, into becoming a habit over, over a few months, then just continues with you through your entire career. Okay. Uh, so, Vishal, what should the first portfolio look like? So, I think, uh, again, you start off with your goals. You have to be very clear that your goals need to define your investment strategy. Uh, it should not be tax planning. It should not be what your friend is doing. It should not be what you've read somewhere saying that this is a place where you can invest in and make maybe great returns. Uh, the first place you start off is trying to say, okay, how much do I want to really save? Uh, there are lots of very scientific ways to do it. But I think for a lot of people who are starting off, they want to do it in a manner where they use some thumb rules. So for example, there is a 50, 30, 20 thumb rule, which gets used very often, where you actually use 50% of your income on, on what you actually need to do or need to spend on. You have another 30% which goes to uh, you know uh, places which are desires, bonds, uh, that sort of space. And then you put the balance 20, 30%, which is left over into investments. 
Now, once you've done that, your first portfolio needs to be driven once again by the goals that you have. So if you need the money, let's say after a year, because you're only going to take a year before you go to study, uh, and you're going to use this as the either the entire fee is going to come out of here, or it's going to become the down payment for an education loan, then you don't want to go into areas like the stock market, because clearly equities are not designed for very short investment horizons. You may deliberately use uh, fixed income sort of instruments, debt mutual funds, bank deposits, those kind of instruments, simply because your goal is dictating your investment strategy. If you're one of those uh, you know, people who are very lucky, um, you, know, you have parents who are already wealthy, this is really your money, you can decide what you want to do with it, then we would strongly suggest that you start saving for your long-term goals right away. Because what you want to do is get to a point where you have financial freedom quickly. Uh, and you are then able to make choices in the way that you want, as far as your career is concerned, as far as your work hours are concerned, as far as um, you know how you want to deal with um, you know family is concerned. All of those choices suddenly become much more open for you once you get closer to financial freedom. Okay, but you know, Vishal, the second big hurdle that comes is that you know you've made your first portfolio, but most people let it be, thinking that you know there's barely any increase in salary. So let this portfolio continue as is, right? But is it equally important to, uh, you know, uh, let your investing corpus also keep pace uh, with whatever, you know, your salary has uh, increased by? And how do you do it? It's absolutely critical. So I think just the way as your salary, just the way your salary is going up, you also want to ensure that your savings rate goes up. And the best way to do this is to automate it. So effectively, what happens is, let's say your salary goes up by 10% uh, and you're saving through, let's say, an SIP or a recurring deposit. Uh, try to ensure that uh, a large part of that 10% automatically goes back as a top up in terms of your investment plan. Um, I think there is a tendency to sort of expand your expenses as your, as your income goes up. But I think you need to be measured. Uh, just ensure that at least half of the increase in compensation that has happened actually goes towards increasing your investments and the other half can go and take care of inflation plus you know some lifestyle changes that you might want to consider but do that very prudently okay but you know in most cases when people are just about getting started in their lives you know even if you count only the most important expenses those expenses keep outweighing whatever is your inflow, right? So you may have clever budgeting, but despite that, most people are just left to play catch up at least in the first few years, right? How do you sort of reconcile this to a more manageable situation? So I think a large part of this is, um, you know, definition of necessity and wants. I think very clearly, uh, you know, across generations, this definition has also changed. And I think it's important to keep in mind that when you are sitting down and and doing budgeting, uh, you define what's the necessity for yourself. Uh, the necessity, once again, for your friend, for your colleague, may be different. Uh, they may be in a different, um, uh, you know, wealth phase. There may be uh, money in the family. There might be a lot of different things that may be happening at the same time. So you need to define what is your list of necessities. Uh, very clearly. And the only way to define it is actually to sit down and uh, create an Excel sheet or write it down on a piece of paper saying that for me, this is my necessity and this is how I want to take care of it. It's also important to educate people in your ecosystem, especially your immediate family who uh, do tend to also have requirements that what is a necessity and what is a want. I think once you've done that very clearly and everyone's uh, gradually coming around to the same page, I think you start to find it so much easier to make this happen because you then don't overspend, uh, you invest regularly, and the whole cycle then becomes a very virtuous cycle. Uh, and of course, like always, like I mentioned multiple times, uh, ensure that you have goals. The moment you have goals, uh, you have timelines with it, you have amounts for those goals attached to it. And because you have all that in place, it now becomes easier for you to decide that when I'm choosing not to spend that money today, this is the benefit that will come to me at a certain point in time because I have a well-defined goal. And I think that's what 
really gets people uh, very, very motivated to continue on this journey because they can see the end goal in place and the benefits that could accrue through that process. Yeah, that's true, actually. And, you know, resurgent India, which is seeing uh, ever expanding middle class has a lot of rising aspirations. And it's today more important than ever, especially since we've come out after two years of a pandemic to keep those aspirations in check. We like, you know, Vishal said, we must be very, very certain between wants and needs. We're going to take a very quick break. But on the other side, we're going to have, you know, more aspects to this conversation. What about if you have irregular income, if you're in a startup or, you know, for example, you want to retire early? Can you plan for it already? All of that is lined up next. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Money, Money, Money. With us is Vishal Dhawan of Plan Ahead Wealth Advisors. And we've been talking about uh, the best way to sort of get started uh, with your financial planning if you're in your late 20s or early 30s. So how do you plan for the future? Uh, you know, Vishal, earlier we've already spoken about, uh, you know, managing expenses and other realistic aspects. But, you know, one aspect which we can't ignore is also rising aspirations, right? So. Uh, you know, a lot of these millennials, uh, you know, you and I can't really fault them for, you know, wanting to delay investing uh, by, say, a few years, you know, because they want to catch up on a bit of consumption, maybe gadgets, entertainment. Many of them are probably living alone for the first time. Many have moved to cities for the first time. So, you know, I mean, I can't really grudge uh, that kind of uh, expense. But as well, we must keep in mind that, you know, wealth creation takes time. So how do you manage consumption and the hope of wealth creation, at least in the early years? So very clearly, I think, um, you know, many of us have also gone through that phase. You know, you sort of start earning, you want to consume, uh, you want to um, uh, just display your wealth or your income a little bit uh, so that, uh, you know, you also feel uh, uh, happy because of that. So a lot of these things are very real emotions that, you know, a lot of people do end up going through. I think the way to approach this is to once again, uh, step back a little bit and think about the fact that uh, while consumption options have expanded significantly, there is also much greater uncertainty in terms of how careers are going to pan out and how long careers are going to be as well. Um, and we are very clearly seeing that a lot of people are now, um, you know, getting a, getting into a, a sort of forced retirement phase in their 40s and 50s at the same time. Uh, and many, uh, many, you just have to look around to see in the, um, maybe the, uh, the building complex that you stay in, maybe in your family, in your friend circle, you will see uh, people retiring much earlier, not necessarily out of uh, out of a uh, deliberate choice. So what you want to do is, while you're thinking about all of this consumption, you also want to think on the other side that there might be much shortened careers that I have to deal with. And also because of the way technology is, is taking over a lot of spaces, you might also end up finding that you have to change multiple careers. And as you change careers, you will also have to keep spending on reskilling yourself in the whole process. So once again, the need to be objective here is very important, saying that uh, you know one part of what I can do with my money is spend it. The other part is I can use it to, uh, to ensure that I can work longer, I can increase my income. Uh, so that sort of uh, allows me to do things for a much longer period of time. The other side of it is that Maybe I, uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that I'm young. I get the benefit of compounding. I can put my money away into assets which are riskier because what happens is while in the short term, the riskier assets can be very volatile. Over very long periods of time, this normalizes. So I think you need to look at a lot of these things. And very, very clearly, I think you need to make a start. Even if you're saving a small amount of money uh, and then investing it, I think it's a great way forward and do it automatically. 
uh, don't try to make every decision a uh, decision where you will say then that oh you know i never had time i'm so tired on the weekends uh, i need some you know space for myself etc just automate the process let it go out of your account uh, ensure that you have credit cards uh, which are limited uh, don't go out of control on spending i think those are the ways that you can really make this happen and and um, you know get your financial goals really in place okay but you know the other reality of our times is that there are any number of people now who are looking at careers you know maybe in startups or you know there are any number of roles now where uh, you know it's more like a freelance kind of concept there may not be regular salary salaries a lot of people uh, you know maybe accepting esops or some other arrangement in lieu of regular salaries so what about planning for them because you know for them getting loans is also not as easy as it is for regular salaried people so how do people like this uh, plan for their future so clearly the gig economy has taken off very significantly uh, and i think the way to look at this is to say that the more i have uh, uncertainty of income and the more i have uh, the inability to be able to project my income forward and get access to loans the more important it becomes for me to focus completely on my uh, personal finances and on my income uh, because i want to be sure that i have an emergency fund available of at least 3 to 6 months in case for some reason uh, my startup fails and i need time to be able to go out and look for an alternative uh, i need to have a process in place where i definitely control my expenses because one of the things that successful startups have done is bootstrap and i think as an employee of a startup you want to bring some of that bootstrapping into your own uh, personal life as well so that you can also be able to save uh, i think every startup founder knows that uh, you know he or she may not be successful and in the same way you need to be aware as an employee in that startup that maybe this won't work in the way that you had planned to and therefore have that provision made as far as your investments are concerned Uh, you still have the ability to use processes like a systematic transfer plan uh, which allow you to uh, you know put money away on a monthly basis after you've put in the lump sum so the money goes into a liquid fund and from there it goes every month this is a bit like an sip in terms of giving you the rupee cost averaging but the money doesn't leave your bank account every month it leaves in spurts when you get the money and i think those are ways that you can uh still continue to invest you don't have to wait to become a salaried employee of a normal uh um, sort of corporate role to decide on on starting your investment journey and you know vishal in our parents generation it was a big deal to continue working till you retired right the voluntary retirement scheme was practically an alien concept for that generation but now uh you know many more people in our generation and of course a lot many more who are younger to us want to retire early nobody wants to be working uh you know till their uh, 60 70 etc they want to start enjoying the money that they have made and want to enjoy life what do you need to do to be prepared for this so very clearly uh, the first starting point has to be to put numbers down and say okay what is it that i require to have with me if i want to retire um keep in mind that inflation is going to continue to happen it's not going to go away just because you choose to retire uh, there is going to be a a need to plan for it so try to estimate what your regular month on month uh, expenses are going to be in retirement uh, obviously keep inflation in mind think about one off expenses that will continue to come for example travel remember you'll have a lot more time you need Uh, you have the ability to travel as a result of that and a lot of travel will come with higher expenses maybe you'll be more socially active you'll be attending a lot more social functions you have gifting to do there all of these comes with cost uh, similarly there might be uh, you know even though you might be retiring you still need to change your vehicle every x number of years so what you need to keep in mind is besides the regular living monthly expenses uh keep in mind that you have these one off expenses that will keep coming plus the healthcare bit because one of the things that will happen inevitably to most of us is that even though we all want to retire early one of the challenges with retirement very often comes with health insurance going away from your employer the fact that your body starts to you know 
slow down in certain ways. It starts to creak in certain ways. Sometimes parts of it give way. So you want to be sure that you have enough money to be able to deal with that. And very, very clearly, the best way to do that is, is get the numbers in terms of what is it that you require and then work with an investment plan to be able to get to that in a very diligent and disciplined manner. And Vishal, uh, now for the real reason why we have called you, which is to pick your brains. You know, we've understood the theory of how to go about it, right? But, you know, you uh, would have helped, I don't know, any number of people now with their uh, portfolios and plans and also a lot of younger people. So therefore, any practical tips that you want to add from, you know, your experience of making so many plans? So I think number one is, you know, starting early. I think... Uh, very often we hear this comment from clients, um, irrespective of the age that they come to us at, saying, I wish we had met 10 years or 15 years earlier. And uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of our clients uh, keep telling us that, uh, let's start working with my children right away. And I think that's the biggest sort of learning that we've had, that you've got to start early. Um, Warren Buffett's, you know, uh, followed so, so closely. And one of the statements he made was that, you know, while he started uh, investing at the age of 11, one of the things that he says uh, in hindsight is he wished he had started at nine. And therefore, I think the earlier you start very clearly, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the second thing you want to be doing is very clearly take control of your finances. Don't be dependent on other people. Very often we find that we are always looking for other people around us uh, to be able to uh, take care of our money requirements. And I think it's it's very, very important that you take control of that. Even if you use a professional advisor, you need to lay down what your financial goals are. You need to lay out when you want those financial goals to get realized. Uh, you need to realize that you know my income is in my control. So the way I will reskill, the way I will work, all of that is controllable at my end. And of course, my expenses as well. So I think a lot of this holistic approach is very, very useful when you actually go out and think about uh, the years that you know we've spent helping people get to financial freedom. The third thing that you want to do, uh, and it's, it's very, very important once again, is that let the tax structure of a particular instrument Right. Not dictate how you want to invest. Uh, the tax is an outcome of a gain that you make. And that gain is going to get taxed in a certain way today. It may get taxed in a different way five years from today, 10 years from today, 15 years from today. You have limited control on it. You need to let your financial goals decide what should be your investment strategy, not your tax strategy become the sort of driver of everything else that happens. And uh, last but not the least, stay on track with your financial goals and your investments. What it means is you need to spend time to go through it, uh, evaluate it. Are you on track? Has something changed? Uh, is your investment strategy working in the way that you wanted it to? Uh, at least twice a year is a good approach to take. I think there's uh, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is they keep checking their portfolios day in and day out. It's not required. Uh, I think you want to stay to a plan. If you want to look at it once a month, just to get an idea in terms of what's happening, that's okay. But get into a deeper review of your investment portfolio at least twice a year and review your financial goals at least once a year to be sure that you stay on track and remember why you're saving money. All right, Vishal, thanks very much for joining in uh, with your very, very practical advice. With that, we'll wind up on this edition of Money, Money, Money and promise to see you again next week. <laughs>